Sam, can you hear me? Yes, you heard me. Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Great. <laughs> we are we hear you. Great, Baruch Hashem. We're in the third Mishnah, part two. So let's just read the Mishnah again together. And Tigunus ish Soho Kibel Mishiman and Tadik Kuaya Mer Al Tihu Kavadim and Misham Shimat Rav and Manat the Kabel Pras, El Hebu Kavadim and Misham Shimat Rav Shalom and the Kabel Pras, the Yi Mora Shemaim Alechem. We're going to make this Shira in Ilu Nishama of the uh, thousands of short soldiers who have fallen in the merit of Midinat Israel. The war that took place uh, of Mohammed Hatzmoud, there was more than 1%. Of the entire population who died. That's roughly equivalent to, in America today, 350,000 people dying in a war, or in Israel today, 80,000 people dying in a war. Um, they had a recognition, some of them well known, and it was well thought through, and some of them it was very deep down in the Neshama, even though I hadn't reached their consciousness of the Gadlut of what they were doing, of dying out of Hashem being the greatest level that one can reach something you don't ask to go into, you don't choose to get into a situation where it happens, but if someone is given the merit of being able to give their life over totally for the sake of Am Yisrael, Sari Yisrael, Hashem's people, at the highest level, the Gemara says that a person who dies on that level, he doesn't have any cheshbon of his averus. He goes straight to a high place in Gan Eden without having any uh, negative uh, path along the way to it. This will show be for the inner Shema of them. So we're going to do a real quick review of what we said yesterday and then take it to the next level. So we open with five questions. Number one, why does it use the language of pras, uh, like the prize or a bonus, as opposed to the language which seems to be saying of reward? Question number two, why does it repeat itself? It's just saying the same thing in positive and in negative. Why does it say first, don't be like the servant serving for reward, rather be like servants not for reward, we get it. You're not saying anything new in the second part, so why the repetition? Question number three, why does it say the word havu? Why does it need that extra language? It's very wordy. Instead of saying al tihiyu kavadim, and then the second part el havu kavadim, it could just say havdu et the rava manat the kavod pras. Very straightforward, more direct. And we also brought the two girsas, uh, the girsaot, the girsa that we have in our sedurim is havu kavadim mashem shdarav shelo'al manat the kavod pras, which implies that there is reward. We're just not doing it for the reward. And the, the, the Girsa of Rabbeinu Yonah, which is, Havu Kavadim Amisham Shemit Arav, Amenat Shalola Kalaprat. I'm doing it on condition that there won't be a reward. We're still trying to understand clearly what Rabbeinu Yonah was adding, what he understood the other level. He brings it as a first opinion, why he rejects it and why he thinks that level is a greater level, a greater understanding. We also brought the fifth question, which is the steer from the Pesukim and also from the Gemara Pashashana. Where a person says, which implies that it's Allah to do that a person should give over uh, mitzvahs for the sake of uh, reward, and this mission implies that it's not the idea. That was the opening introduction that we gave of the five questions. Then we gave three different levels that we described. We're going to summarize them just in a minute. We'll take one minute to summarize it. The lowest level, which is a person that's totally self centered, where all they really care about is themselves and their own reward. They see at Kaddish Baruch Hu as uh, like a government where you have to pay taxes, so you pay the taxes. They see them as like a negative, uh, stronger being that they have to interact with and have no choice. They don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to get punished, so they'll behave appropriately. They want to see how much they can benefit from this interaction, so they'll do whatever it takes to get good reward. But basically, that Kaddish Baruch Hu is not a playing factor. They're the center of the world. They're all that they really care about. And on that level, we quoted the Rambam yesterday at the Nechos Tshuva. Mashal, I'm adding now, Mashal Imagine you have a child who doesn't have enough protein. So the mother wants to give the child chicken, but the child doesn't enjoy chicken. He doesn't like eating chicken. So the mother says, if you eat chicken, you'll be able to have ice cream as dessert. When I see here a clean plate, ice cream for dessert. So that child doesn't have any interest in the chicken, but he's just thinking ice cream, ice cream, ice cream, ice cream. And he finishes off all of the chicken and he's able to get the ice cream. That's Amen not like Kabel Pras. There's something extra that I'm looking forward to, what I'm working towards, what my goal is. And I accomplished it. I got the ice cream. After you ask him, did you eat the chicken? He won't even remember. It wasn't significant to him. It just passed. And he got the end goal that he wanted. But, uh, and Tignos himself was saying, don't serve Hashem on that level. Where you're the center, your goals, your desires, your dreams, is all you care about. 
And Kodesh Baruch is kind of a, is an annoying Moshel that you have to figure out how to work in order to get your way in this world. That level number one, rejected. Then level number two that we spoke about was the level of pras. And this is the level which uh, many people exist on. It's where they live in the world where Torah and mitzvahs are a part of their life. It's pleasant for them. They're, they're happy they're doing it. They're not doing it because they're scared of being punished if they don't do it. They're not doing it because they're really hoping they'll get good reward in the next world. But at the same time, they're not necessarily building anything with it. And the way you can see this example expressed is that if an opportunity for a mitzvah comes their way and they can do it, they'll do it. And if they don't, it doesn't bother them so much. And the, the concept of regret here won't place a strong factor. When it's Yom Kippur and there's a mitzvah to feel regret, then they'll work on feeling regret. But if they have a, a veil that they do, and they weren't really at fault for doing it so much, even if they were, but said that, you know, things happen. These things happen to many people. It won't bother them so much. Why? Because they see Yiddishkeit as a pras. They see it as a bonus. If I'm serving Hashem and I get extra merit, what a great opportunity that I have. I'm happy to do it. You're giving me more opportunities, Hashem, to have a, an enjoyable life, a nice life, a nice family, a nice home, Shabbos meal. Learning Torah is very interesting to me. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not anti. I don't see Hashem as evil. I see Hashem as very kind. Like the example we gave yesterday, if you imagine someone is performing, juggling, playing guitar on the street, and someone walks past them and throws them some money, how does the performer view that person? They don't view them as, they're going to punish me. They also don't view them as, they owe it to me, it's my right. Magiali, they have to give me the money. Not at all. They're not like that in any respect. They don't think that they deserve punishment. They don't think they deserve reward. But if someone, if they're performing well, and it's enjoyable to play the guitar and do the juggling, and someone throws them money, it's a bonus. Why not? A great life. That's the level of serving Hashem for pras. For pras. It's not for schar. You don't think you expect it. You're not saying you deserve it. You're not saying I, I need to be paid the money. Or rather, it's a pras. I'm getting a bonus. I'm getting a, a benefit that I'm getting out of it. So I, the interaction that I've had with many people, that's the level of their Yiddish. They're happy they're Jewish. They're happy to do mitzvahs. They, they're not doing it because they're scared of punishment. They're not really thinking about reward. But if you ask them deeply, what are you building with it? Where are you aiming towards? What's your goals? What's your aspirations? I'm not sure they've ever really thought deeply about that question. They're just saying, I don't get it. It's just it's nice, it's beneficial, it's a good life. Why not? Like, I don't have anything wrong with it. Why should I rock the boat? Why should I make a fuss? That's the level of pras. And that's the, what he's, or in the second statement, what he's coming to reject. He's saying, Don't even do it. Obviously, don't do it for schan. But don't even do it for pras. Don't even do it because it's pleasant for you and it's enjoyable for you. That answers question number one, why it uses the word pras. That answers question number two, why it has double language. It's coming to reject both of those levels. Now, let's go to question number four. Let's try and understand this double language, the, la the, the double, the two girsas, and the two ways of interpreting it. This is what we started yesterday. The first girsa is our standard girsa, the girsa we have in the, uh, in the Sidurim, which is a more logical one initially, at surface value. Havu ka'avadim ha'mishamshim et arav shalva almanad le'kabal pras. Do it, know that you're going to get reward. But don't do it for the reward. And we gave the example yesterday of if you have a carpenter who has too much work, so he gives some of his work to a fellow experienced, skilled carpenter, they see themselves as equal, and therefore it's obvious that if I'm giving you a job, then you're going to get paid for it. That's the expectation that takes place. However, if I have an apprentice who's coming to work under me, and this apprentice is coming to work from underneath me, then he's not yet skilled. And I don't have to pay him for any work he does. He's not expecting any payment for work he does. In fact, on the contrary, he should really be paying me. I'm giving him a skill. I'm teaching him a lesson. He'll be very honored to work by someone more skilled because he's gaining the skill. He'll be willing to pay for that. And he certainly won't be expecting any uh, reward for that. Not, not, not on the level of sakhar, not on the level of pras. He's not expecting anything. And that's a higher level to aim towards. And just to explain more deeply what this level is. That's what we got to yesterday. Let's explain a little more deep now what is behind that level. Behind that level, and what Antirinus Ishsoho is trying to build, is that what is the perspective, the relationship with Hashem that we need to have in serving Him? We mentioned that the last Mishnah was telling us the what to do, the three pillars of the world stands on the what, 
And this Mishnah is teaching us the how you should be doing it. What your mind perspective should be when you're coming to serve Hashem. So on this level, which is the Pshat level, which is the level of the Gersel that we have, the level is a level of humility. Don't come into the relationship with Hashem as an equal. Don't say, Hashem, you know, you asked me to do it for you. Okay, I'll do you a favor. Hashem, you said davening now. Okay, I'll daven for you. I'll do it for you. We're equal. But I expect payment. I expect reward. The level of someone who's an equal to someone else. I'm a carpenter, you're a carpenter. If I'm giving you a job, then I expect to get paid for it. That, to some degree, is an arrogant mindset. It's not arrogant if we really are equal. Then it's just it's, it's a standard contract that two people make. But when we're talking about Akadosh Baruch who has given us our entire life, we owe him everything. He doesn't owe us anything. And he's giving us the opportunity to work under him. He's giving us mitzvahs to elevate ourselves and perfect ourselves. Every mitzvah we do makes us more refined and closer to Hashem. Then this mission is coming to give us the perspective. When you come to Daven, when you come to put on tefillin, when you come to learn Torah, recognize the God look of what you're coming to do. Hashem has given you the opportunity to work under Him. This is a mindset and a perspective of humility. I don't deserve it. Lo magia li klum. I don't deserve anything. Everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives me is a pure favor. Absolute chesed. He doesn't des- I don't deserve it. He's doing me a tova. When you come to do a mitzvah, instead of saying, like the level of trust that we just described, why not? Why not? It doesn't harm anything. doesn't do anything bad. It's enjoyable. It gives me a, it gives me a nice interaction that I have with other people. I get to come to shul, meet other people. Now I don't get to the shul. I get to Zoom and see other people. I have these nice interactions. But why not have the beneficial thing? I'm looking for what bonuses or benefits that I'm getting from it. That's as if you're saying to some degree you're an equal. I deserve it or at least I'm benefiting from it. Here we're saying, correct your perspective. Humility. Hashem is above you. You are underneath him. That's the level that we're aiming towards. Don't expect that you have. And that level is a mindset which Rabbeinu Yona sees as not ideal. Now, when we're reading it, it seems like an ideal mindset. We don't deserve anything. Lo magia li klum. Everything I'm doing to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu is a tova that he's doing for me. And I'm grateful for the opportunity that I have to work for him. He's accepted me to be an apprentice by him. I, I'm a Jew. I'm not a non-Jew. I'm a Jew and I've been chosen, the chosen nation. To be an apprentice by the king. That's a tremendous opportunity and I'm very, very grateful for it. Not everyone was accepted. There was, the, there was a, a whole test you had to do to see if you would be Zohar to be the one who would get to be the apprentice. And you got to be the apprentice. It's a great opportunity. Thank you, Hashem. That's a high level. But there's a higher level. Let's try and think deeply. What's lacking in that level? What was wrong with that level that Rabbeinu Yonah preferred the other gears? An apprentice... If you think deeply, an apprentice, he's happy to be working for the master, but not because he cares about the master. He cares about the skills that he's picking up from the master and how he's perfecting himself, which essentially means that the level of avadima mesham shimet arav, shelo almanat lekabal pras, means they're not doing it for reward. They're not doing it for a bonus. But they're doing it for shleimut. Now, shleimut to Adam is a tremendous level. It's a, a person who wants to perfect his character traits. A person who wants to perfect his mind. A person who wishes to perfect his emotions. That is a tremendous level. But what would happen if you would offer him reward? He would say, great. If the apprentice would be given award, he'd be very happy to take it. And what would happen if he's already perfected himself and the master's now died? That's fine. It doesn't bother me so much. I've already perfected myself. So the level before Rabbeinu Yonah's change, the level of the Pshat of the Mishnah, is essentially saying you should serve Hashem for Shleimus. Your goal should be for you to reach Shleimus. Like the uh, Mr. Zishan writes, the three levels of people, the highest level of the three is Shleimus Adat. Shleimus, I'm looking to be the most perfect self that I can be. But you still hear a little bit of the self there. You still can hear in that answer, you're not necessarily goal to build a relationship with the master. It's in a way the master is still there for me. 
Meaning, I'm coming to work from the master, to learn from him, to pick up skills so that I can be shalem. My goal is for my own shlemus. So comes Rabbeinu Yonah, and he has a different gear. And let's see why he prefers this gear. Rabbeinu Yonah's gear says, Ela havu ka'avadim ha'mashimshim et arav al menat shelo lekabel pras. It sounds like according to Rabbeinu Yonah, it would be offensive if you would give reward. Now, the example that we gave of the apprentice, it would not be offensive if you would give reward. In fact, it would actually be a compliment. In going back to the example of the apprentice, if I would be a skilled um, a carpenter and someone works under me, and I'm very happy with their work, and I say to them, you did amazing work. They say, thank you. And I say to them, you know what, I even want to pay you for it. And they say, really? You think I'm that great? Thank you. Meaning, if they're still willing to accept the reward, then their goal is their own shlemus. And the getting the reward is an expression of seeing how they're actually very great. Let's give a new mashal. And this mashal is also from the Ruach Chaim in his first interpretation. I'm adapting a little bit, but this is the crux of what he's saying. Imagine if you lived in a town where there weren't any Godoli Hador who lived in that town, but there was one of the Godoli Hador who used to travel around the world and he was coming to your town. Now, this Gadal Ador was known to be someone, as well as being tremendously great in Torah, the greatest Torah scholar of our generation. He also was sterling character. He was, Midas were extremely refined. And they say that if you just look at his face, it gives you a sense of Yirat Shemayim. Just to look at him, just to see the Malach, to see the Gadol Adam. Now, this Gadal Ador is also known that he doesn't take anything from anyone. He's very independent. He doesn't want any favors. If you try and do him a favor, he always finds a way not to accept a favor. And he's always independent. He does things totally independent. A malach, not, no side benefits, no ulterior motives. His dedication to Kalali Yisrael is well-renowned. And you're, you're looking forward to his visit to the town because it's an opportunity that you're now going to have to see this malach, just to see him, get a glimpse of him, and to see what godless is, to see closeness, the closest a person can be to being a perfect person. We're very excited about it. And then he comes finally to the town. There's a procession, and you're standing there as he's walking into the base medrash where he's going to give the shiur. And as he walks past you, he feels weak for a moment. And, and he turns to you, and he looks at you, and he says, excuse me, could you give me some water? This Gadol Ador is looking at you in the face. Panim el Panim. You're looking at him. And not only that, but he's asking you for a favor. You will run off. And as soon as you can, you will get the water and you'll bring it to him. What a sot that you have. What a merit that you were granted. And as you give him the water, he asks you the question, how much were you expecting for that? And for you, the question is almost offensive. Revi. And it's interesting because it's not your Rebbe. You've never learned anything from him, but, but you feel you've learned more from just looking in his face and seeing that God looks at Adam. Really, please, no, no, no. Please, let me give it to you. That's my opportunity to come close to you. The merit that I have to grant you something. And he says for a moment, no, 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 please, I want to pay. Say, please, Rebbe, please, the greatest thing in the world for me will be if you just accept this from me. Like the Gemara and Kedushin, you can marry someone with that merit. And the Rebbe says, Oh, I appreciate it so much. Thank you. And you feel in Gan Eden, you've met the Gadol. You've built a Kesher with the Gadol. He now sees you as a friend. You see him as a role model. You'll go to the Shur. When you're sitting in the Shur and listening to him speaking, you'll be thinking the whole time, we have a connection. I'm close to the Gadol. I have a personal connection. You're going to tell everyone that story. Your children, your grandchildren, will go down in generations. You see this hand. This hand gave water to the Godel Ador. That will be your son. You won't want any other son. Now, could you imagine the chutzpah if you, and, and the missed opportunity, if you would say to him, oh yeah, that costs five shekel. Are you crazy? You had the chance to be close to the Godel Ador, to have the relationship built, the schus of the kesher, and you're asking for money? It's offensive. Almanat Shalola Kabel Pras, says Rabbeinu Yonah. 
the highest level of serving Hashem. And this is in Rashi, and it's in the Rambam, and it's in Rabbeinu Yonah, and it's in the Maharal, and it's in the Oruah Chayim. Everyone that I was looking at says the same concept, some in depth, some in, in breadth, and some in just the word. But this Mishnah is teaching Avas Hashem. Avas Hashem means you're not looking for any side benefit. The feeling that you have of the opportunity of being close to Hashem, that's your end goal. That's your reward. That's what you're looking for. The Tveikus that you have with that Kadosh Baruch Hu is the goal that you have set yourself for serving Hashem. And therefore the gear Sa'al, Al Manat Shalola Kabal Pras. My goal is not to receive reward. I know I've told this story numerous times, but I, I want to share it again. I was once in a Vad, and in the Vad, the Rebbe who was giving the Vad was generating within the Talmidim Avas Hashem. So he said to each of the Talmidim, think to yourselves of someone who you love deeply. So I had in my mind someone who I love deeply. And then he said, Okay, think of three reasons why you loved it. And I was very challenged to do that. I was thinking, I love them because, uh, because they make great, uh, great, great stuff. I need. That's the reason. Well, if they wouldn't make great stuff, I, I would still love them. Okay, that's not it. I love them because, because, because they, uh, the, the house is all orderly and clean. And that's like, a, I, I'm grateful for that, but that's not why I love. And again and again, I was thinking, and I was totally stuck. I couldn't find a good answer. So I came to the Rebbe at the end, and I said, Rebbe, I was very challenged to do it. He said to me, tell me, describe me what was your challenge. I said, every time I try and use my intellect and my mind to think why I love, I felt there's more. That's not it. There's something much deeper here. I can't describe it in words. And he said to me, oh, no, no, sorry, sorry, my, my fault. I wasn't clear enough. What I meant to say was, think of three times, occasions, situations, where you deeply feel the love. Not why. Don't go to the intellect. Just go to that place of feeling of love. In Shema Yisrael, we get a hint of how to feel that love. How to feel that love. And we say Shema Yisrael, the bracha just before Shema Yisrael, we say, Baruch Ata Hashem, Ohev Amo Yisrael. When you generate within yourself the recognition that HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves you, then you start to feel we finish as we continue after Shema. Love is something that you can't pinpoint. And you can't use the intellect. And you can't say, I love Hashem because he took us out of Egypt. That's why I love him. And if he wouldn't have taken you out of Egypt, then you wouldn't love him. The idea of a gratitude journal, I want to describe that for a minute. One of the main ways is the feeling love for Hashem is to write out at length, at length, at length, all the tovas that Hashem has done for you. And it's a tremendous, tremendous exercise. And it's very beneficial. But between me and you, let me ask you a personal question. Between me and you, if all those things wouldn't happen, if Hashem wouldn't have given you one, two, three, four, then are you justified not to love him? Not at all. Of course not. Meaning when you're doing a gratitude journal, you're just writing down situations, opportunities that have brought you to recognize the feeling that you have of love. But you're not saying you love Hashem because of those. Even if those wouldn't exist, you would still love them. Someone on a lower level would say, I'm doing it for a reward. I'm doing it for a price. So if Hashem gives me the good, then I'll love Him. And if not, not. We've now reached the high level. On the highest level, we're serving Hashem. We don't want reward. We want the Kesha with Hashem. And here is the crux of the matter. When you come to do a mitzvah, whatever your mindset is, Whatever your goal is in doing the mitzvah, that is what you will get out of the mitzvah. So if you are given the opportunity to meet the God of Ador, you're about to meet him, and you say, you know what I want? You know what I really want? I want the God of Ador to give me a signature. I'm going to bring a book of his, and he's going to sign it for me. And then you say, the God of, the God of Ador greets you, and, 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 and you can ask anything, and you say, Rabbi, and he says, yes, my child. And you say, could you sign over here, please? And he signs, and you go, oh, thanks. And you run off. So what cash have you built with the Rebbe? You built a signature. And imagine if you come to learn Torah and do Hashem's mitzvahs, and your mindset is you want to be very honorable, then you'll accomplish that goal that you've set for yourself. And you'll be honorable in this world. But what a missed opportunity. You had the chance to be close to Hashem. And if you say it's worthwhile for me on the level of trust, 
it's worthwhile for me to be religious because it's nice. I have a nice environment and a nice feeling of my family and friends. It's enjoyable for me. Why not? Why not? I get a lot of benefit from it. You know what you'll get from that? You'll get that benefit. You'll have a nice family, you'll have a nice friend. But you know what you'll be missing? The opportunity to be close to Hashem. You'll miss the dvekus. However, says Antigonish Yisocha, if you set for yourself your goal, the reason you're doing the mitzvahs is the love of Hashem. Then instead of asking in theory, how does one feel love for Hashem, a theoretical question, every time you will do a mitzvah, it will be another opportunity to bring you closer to feel Hashem. You've made that your target. Allah at Hashem is your goal. Whatever you set as your goal, that's what you'll reach. If you set as your goal to get rewards in the next world, you'll get reward in the next world. But you'll miss the Kesha with Hashem. If you set as your goal in, to have benefit in this world, have a nice environment, you'll get that. You'll miss the connection with Hashem. If you set as your goal, Avas Hashem, the close feeling with Hashem, that's what you'll get. You'll get to feel already in this world. You'll get to feel a Kesha and Tveikos. You'll feel alive with the connection with Hashem. So just to conclude, three people come to Dav and Marib. Let's describe the different approach of each of those three people, how they're coming to Dav and Marib. Person number one comes to Dav and Marib and he's thinking to himself, I'm going to get a great Olam Haba. Or, if I don't do this, I'm going to get really punished. I don't want to get punished. So he comes to Daven, and he's very careful on every word that he says. And he's thinking all the time, let me not make a mistake in the words. I don't want to get punished. And he's thinking, what an amazing opportunity this is to get so much reward. Another mitzvah, more reward. Another mitzvah, more reward. Another mitzvah, more reward. That's his mindset. He Daven's very well. It works very well. Going back to the example that we gave beforehand of the Rambam, if you give a child candy to convince him, or in the example we gave, if you give someone ice cream to eat chicken, it worked. He ate the chicken. This person, Davin Mariv, very well. So he's thinking not about the Mariv. He's not thinking about the Keshe with Hashem. He's thinking about the ice cream or the spiritual ice cream. So that's what his mindset is. That's where his goal is. So he's missed something major, but he did it. He did the mitzvah and he'll get reward for the mitzvah. That's a lower level, number one. Level number two. A person comes to Davin Mariv and he says, you know, I really enjoy this. It's time just to be quiet, to think about my life a little bit, not to have to hear all my friends talking the whole time, just to have like, some quiet time, to see all my other friends in shul. You look down a little bit. He said, he said, I'm talking about that. Some people like it because it gives them time to like, think of ideas. They find themselves like a good six, seven minutes, able to like daydream and all great ideas. Ideas come their way. There's a lot of side benefits that you get, and it's, it's very enjoyable and very beneficial. Why not? What are good things I'm getting from it? What do they get from davening Mariv? They daven Mariv, they keep the halachic of Mariv. If they miss a Mariv, it doesn't bother them so much. But if they daven Mariv and they're there and they get a lot of side benefits, it's brass, they're getting all these side benefits they're getting. That's what they aim for, that's what they got. The highest level, according to Reina Yona, is a follow. I come to daven Mariv. I try and feel love for Hashem. Sometimes I feel it more, sometimes I feel it less. But I know that's my goal. So I come and I sit down with Avon Mariv. And I say the bracha, Baruch Atah Hashem, Ohev Amo Yisrael. And in my mind, I'm thinking, Hashem loves me. Hashem loves Kali Yisrael. Hashem, I love you too. I don't always feel it. Right now I'm feeling it kind of 80%, 60%. I'm feeling, but Hashem, that's what I'm aiming towards. And I know, Hashem, that you love me. I know it firstly because I know it because of all the good you've given me and I've been thinking about that all the time, all the good. But more than that, Hashem, it's like the relationship with my wife. It's, it, you don't have to describe a reason why. I'm just developing the relationship just through the thought that you're the God that I adore and the opportunity to be close to you and the opportunity just to have the Kesha with you. Panim el Panim. That's all I'm looking for, Hashem, to have the Kesha. What I'm looking for, Hashem, is the Tvekos, to build the relationship. It's so enjoyable for me to be here for no other reason and other than build my connection. And then with that, you say Shema. And with that, you say, You're saying it. You're deepening an authentic feeling of feeling love for Hashem. And that is the highest level. And someone would say to you, when you finish that, you go, you did really well. The Rosh Hashiva was watching you and he thinks you're a tzaddik. You think, no, 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 I'm not doing it for that. I'm not doing it for some side reward or some side benefit. Forget it. I don't want that. I don't want, even if Hashem would tell me that, I wouldn't be interested. 
with the closeness to Hashem, the Kivat Hashem Lito, that developing a love relationship with Hashem, that was my goal. That was my whole goal. And whatever goal you set for yourself, that's what you'll accomplish. It says Antigone as you you wish to desire a closeness to Hashem, that's what you set for yourself as your target, you can accomplish it. Set love as your goal for Avas Hashem. I want to use that to answer one final question. Question number three. Question number three was, so why doesn't it just say, love Hashem? This is the question the Maharal asked tonight. Because this is a situation which should be a constant state of being. He's saying the words, It should be your whole essence. You should be. That should become your state of being. It should become your mindset, your thought. Hashem, my goal is Ahava. My goal is closest to you. That's what I'm aiming towards. That's what I'm desiring. Havu, be, be there. Let that be your state. And the final, final question. What is the ending? Yihi mora shomayim alechem. Why does Antigonus Ishsofo need to have that ad ending? What did it add? What did it gain? This is the last question, the additional question we haven't asked until now. New question. Why does the Mishnah end by he mora shomayim alechem? So I saw the Tosfas Yom to the beautiful interpretation. The whole goal of this Mishnah is to teach not to serve Hashem from a low level, but rather serve Hashem from a higher level. Now when we speak about Mora Shemayim, why doesn't it say Mora HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Say Hashem, directly, why Shemayim? And in general, why do we say Shemayim? Are we serving Shemayim? Or we say that a person does a mitzvah L'Shem Shemayim? You do it for the sake of the clouds? L'Shem Shemayim? What is Shemayim? Say L'Shem HaKadosh Baruch Hu? What is L'Shem Shemayim? Explain the Tosis Yom that there's a mistake that one could make. If you say you're doing it for the sake of Hashem, you might think you're doing it for the sake of Hashem on the first, first level. I'm scared of Hashem. Hashem may punish me. Or I'm doing it for the sake of Hashem that he'll give me lots of reward because he's the one who'll give me reward. So if it would say, I, you should fear Hashem, you wouldn't recognize, you wouldn't see that you're on that highest level. Shemayim represents that you're not coming from underneath of Yirat Onesh, you're coming from above. As the Holy Swarim say, that if a person wishes to engender within himself Yirat Shemayim, he should look at the Shemayim and seeing the vastness. A Shemayim is Sabrim Kavod Kel. When you see the vastness of the heavens, just Tcheles, the Kara Tcheles, that brings you closer to the recognition of Hashem. And that imbues within a person Yirat Haromimus. The highest level. And that's where a person comes to feel the love for Hashem. So that last line of Yehi Mor Shemayim Alechem is a guideline of how to engender oneself with the love of Hashem. Not to serve from below. Not to serve near to Onish. Rather come from above. Think the godless. Think with Shemayim perspective. The shame Shemayim means with a Yiras Aromas from a higher perspective. And that will engender within our heart. And that message is a message which is the final message said by an individual. From now on, it's always going to be pairs. And Be'ezrat Hashem will explain this in more depth, but from now on, you'll see, we'll get, from here till the end of the Mishnah, all of the pairs pick either Ahava or Yira. Each one expresses a different side. And it was all based on this message of Rabbi uh, Antikonot Ishsof, saying the main part in Avodot Hashem is the Ahava Hashem. At the same time, you have to have Mora Shemayim, which is the balancing out, not getting carried away too much, where you you lose the sense and you lose the control of the halacha. You have the balance of Ahav and Hira. And that last one we'll discuss in more depth. So in summary, the goal of this Mishnah, if you make your agenda to feel close to Hashem, if you make your agenda in everything you do for no reward, no side benefit, not even Shlei Musa Adam, according to Rabbeinu Yonah, but rather the highest level of pure love for Hashem. For no other benefit. I don't want any other reward. I just want that closeness. If you make that your goal, then already here in this world, you will start to recognize and develop that love and focus you have with Hashem. Thank you very much, Rabbi.